Bitcoin could be the new currency for global trade. Citibank says. Of course, that's Dorian Nakamoto. We often have an image of him hanging here. And this is the much talked about report out of Citibank that many um, academic economists were uh, very upset with. But basically what Citibank is saying, and they're one of the biggest recipients of bailouts in American history <laughs> and part of this financial system whereby, um, you know, China's eating their lunch and payment system because the likes of Citibank never bothered to uh, get out of bed. They wouldn't get out of bed for $10,000. You know, they, they can't be bothered to come up with any innovations. Well, they, in a report entitled Bitcoin at the Tipping Point, it charts the evolution of Bitcoin from a form of payment to its current status as the store of value. The authors forecast that Bitcoin's core properties combined with its global reach and neutrality could see it morph into the currency of choice for international trade in around years. It's happening right now because the transaction is the settlement. So you don't need, don't need Citibank. It obviates Citibank. It makes Citibank redundant, as are all banks redundant with Bitcoin. I can trade with you as a currency and it uh, doesn't require any bank, doesn't require a central bank. And th they got a little bit reversed. They're saying it started off as a means of payment and people are looking at it as a store of value. But in fact, it started off as a store of value and now it's morphing into a means of payment. That's the whole history of money. So Citibank should know at least the history of money and how money comes into existence. But nevertheless, a good effort and I applaud them for at least recognizing that they're about to go out of business. But being involved in Bitcoin early in those days, there were many participants who thought it was like, we're going to compete with PayPal. We're going to compete with Visa. It's going to be a, a settlement. You know, it's going to be uh, used for as a means of exchange like that. As you point out, it was actually always a store of value. And in fact, they point out the perceptions. They say perceptions about what makes Bitcoin important continue to evolve and create new opportunities while increasing its perception towards becoming mainstream. It's becoming more mainstream because people's perceptions, i.e. the thing that the Fed, Jerome Powell, is always trying to manage, perceptions, right? They, that's what they Fed speak is all about. They go out there to speak to the market and say, don't worry, we're going to take care of inflation. Don't worry, we're not printing too much money. You might perceive it if you look over there, like at the food costs, like you might perceive it as a bad situation. But listen to me, I'm, I'm, you know, massaging your perception about the situation. Well, here the situation is being perceived as being a better store of value than the U.S. dollar, and perceived by international um, participants in the global market. Anybody who has anything to sell anywhere on any continent or any country on Earth. They're perceiving this as a more neutral, uh, better to use settlements layer. Right, there's what, $5 trillion a day in Forex market, foreign exchange, and that can be completely replaced with uh, a Bitcoin as the base layer. And we've seen that demonstrated uh, now uh, by sending uh, currency from country to country, uh, starting off in one currency, arriving at the destination in that local currency instantaneously, uh, virtually at no cost. Central bank digital currencies under the bus. They're like, central bank digital currencies, by, by definition, are central. Therefore, they cannot compete with Bitcoin. So Citibank, again, just threw another industry under the bus. Yeah, I mean, uh, because, of course, the central bankers are going to look at this threat, uh, the competitor, a better competitor of Bitcoin, and say, well, how do we act like them? How do we, like, maybe we just form a blockchain. That's all you need, right? That's what it's all about. But no, it's the neutrality and the permissionless nature of it, censorship resistant because this is another thing that as, you know, whoever controls that system, and it's a dollar system right now, like obviously they were pretty fair and open about it when they were the world, they were outcompeted everybody. When we produced all the semiconductor chips, when we produced all the cars, when we produced all the high tech, but now that other countries are, are way ahead of us on, in, in some aspects, we're like, mm, eh, well, you know what? We're going to slow your payments down. That's how we can outcompete you. We're going to make it harder for you to even trade with anybody. So this is what Citibank is saying. They're agreeing with us. Once again, Kaiser Report was right. <laughs> Citibank was wrong until now. China has a five-year lead over the U.S. in e-commerce payments. China's already working on 6G, whereas U.S. has yet to roll out 5G. Uh, the U.S. has no 5G. The product from Verizon is a hoax. They don't have 5G. So we borrowed $4 trillion last year, increased the money supply by 
it seems like we're you know really far behind on technology and we're borrowing too much money chris i mean what how is this playing in washington are the alarm bells sounding or are they asleep at the switch one of the things that china does is they play a long game they play a 25 50 100 year game of chess while we play checkers all day long on share price fluctuations on a day-to-day -day basis quarterly results two to four year election cycles etc and that creates a real problem for us to invest in infrastructure and for us to invest in r d they are doing that great and by the way if you want to look at case studies the best ones to look at right now are 1993 when they said they are not going to participate in our gps or our global positioning satellite system they were going to create their own and guess what they have in 1997, they said they are not going to participate in the World Wide Web. Um, they wanted to create their own and bifurcate it from the rest of the world. Guess what? They have. They're doing the same thing with 5G and 6G, and they're going to do it with microchips on their 2025 vision. We are getting left behind, and we need to smarten up. One thing about Donald Trump, whether you liked him or hated him, he pulled the fire alarm and said, we need to wake up to this China challenge. Time is running out and we need to get serious about it. Whether he applied getting serious to it or not is one thing to debate. But what he did do is pull the fire alarm. We need to keep pulling it. We need to implement change. I noticed that Stan Druckenmiller, very famous money manager, he said he's going very, very short the dollar in long Asia. Okay, so money flows to where the returns are the greatest. And uh, so the money management industry doesn't seem phased by these issues, Chris. It's disheartening because, quite frankly, our capital markets and our investor base is really what's powering the engine of China. Um, you know, I have no problem with capitalism. In fact, I love capitalism and I love free markets. And as you and I have discussed both online and offline, I don't even know if we really have capitalism. It's more of a cronyism. Uh, situation that I think is overtaken our capitalism system, but let's pretend we have capitalism. One thing that we need to think of in regards to the way we engage China now is on a patriotism first level and then capitalism. As long as we start to realize that our capitalism, the base of our capitalism, the base of the freedoms that we have in business, have the foundation of a strong republic, the ability to have a United States of America that we built over the last 200 years and protect the security interests of and the welfare of, then that capitalism will continue to flourish. The problem is, is we've been selling out the nation that has allowed us to have this form of capitalism just for returns on quick quarterly results and PLs and revenue growths that are pumping up our stocks and making investors rich. It's as simple as the SEC, for instance. If you look at the way China gets access to our capital markets, they do not have to apply the same accounting standards as every other company around the world. Why? Because they hide behind state secrets laws, which they say apply to them, because technically all these private companies are SOEs, or state-owned enterprises. We've got to end that. If you want access to US capital markets, if you want access to private equity, if you want access to M&A activity, we need to embolden CFIUS to be even stronger, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. And we need to allow the SEC to patrol these Chinese companies and regulate them the exact same way every other company gets access to our markets.